us when we die. Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. So this afternoon, we want to have a look at what the Bible tells us uh, about what happens when we die. Because it's a sad fact, isn't it, that death comes um, to all of us at some point. It affects all of us um, at some point in our lives. Uh, and so throughout history, there have been many different ideas and thoughts uh, about what happens when we do die. Uh, and what we want to do this afternoon is to look at what the Bible tells us happens when we die and what hope um, there might be for us after death. But before we do that, first of all, I just want to have a look at why we die in the first place. Uh, and we had an introductory reading from Genesis chapter 3. Uh, and I want to start it in the book of Genesis, um, but just in the previous chapter. Because the beginning of our Bibles tells us the reason why we die. It tells us the reason that God has, has created the heavens and, and the earth... Uh, but then why? We, we, we die at some, at some point. So let's go first of all to Genesis uh, and chapter 2. And we just want to read verse 7. Then we read, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so this is right at the beginning, and this is when God created mankind. And it says that he formed man or of the dust of the ground. There was an action by God to create, um, create man. Uh, and we read there that he was created from the ground uh, and then God breathed into his nostrils um, the breath of life. And if we come down the chapter in Genesis chapter 2 to verse 15, we see that once God had created man, he gave him a commandment. And so verse 15 of Genesis chapter 2 the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And so man had been created, and he was then given a commandment to follow in, in his life. And God gives Adam uh, um, uh, and subsequently Eve this one commandment to follow. And it was that they could eat of all the trees which God had created with the exception of, of one tree. And that was with the exception of the tree of, um, called, well, called the knowledge of, of good and evil. And so he's given this commandment to follow. But there is a warning uh, as well when this commandment is given. Because if you look in that verse 17, at the end of those verses... It says, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And so man was created and he was not dying at that point in time. But he is told that if he breaks the commandments of God, then he would surely die. And so man has been created and has then been given um, a commandment. And if we come to Genesis chapter 3, that reading which we had uh, as an introduction... We saw the events that took place in the garden where Adam and Eve broke the commandments of God. And verses 1 to 7 of Genesis chapter 3 detail for us those events. If we just skip through um, those, um, those few verses. Verse 1, the serpent comes um, to Eve and challenges her and says, Hath God said you shall not eat of the fruit, um, sorry, of every tree or of the garden? So he challenges Eve about what God ha has told Adam and Eve. And, and verse 2 and verse, um, verse 3, Eve repeats back to the serpent the commandments which God ha has given them. But then verse 4 and verse 5, the serpent deceives Eve by telling her that this was not going to happen. In fact, in um, verse, verse 4, the serpent says to Eve, you shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And so the serpent is declaring the exact opposite to what God has said. That they would not die if they ate of the fruit. But then if we come down to, to verse 7, or sorry, verse 6, what was it that actually happened? Well, verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise... She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, 
and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And so they broke the commandments of, of God. And Adam and Eve had been created. They had been given a commandment from God to follow, and they had now disobeyed. They had broken um, that commandment. And so God then um, gives them, well, punish, punishes them. And so from verse, um, verse 13 onwards, there are punishments given to the serpent, to Eve and to Adam for breaking the commandments of God. And we just want to pick out um, a couple of verses, and that is from verse 17. And this is a punishment which are given to Adam. And, and, and we read there, verse 17, unto Adam... Um, God said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and have eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also, and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And then verse 19 is a critical one. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And so Adam is told that he would return unto the ground. And in that verse 19, God says, um, for out, of, out of it, out of the ground, wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Uh, and so verse, Genesis, sorry, in Genesis chapter 2, man, God had formed man of the dust or of the ground. And now man is told that he would return to the dust of the ground because he had broken the commandments of God. He is told that he is now going to die because he has broken the commandments of God. And so Adam and Eve, right at the beginning of, of, of human history, they died because they broke the commandments of God. It was a punishment for breaking the commandments of God. And so that's how death first of all, first came um, into the world. But we could write, quite rightly ask, well, what about us? After all, we weren't there, were we, when Adam and Eve broke the commandments of God? So why, why do we still die today? Why is it that everyone that's lived after Adam and Eve ha has died, although they weren't the ones who broke the commandments of God? Well, Keep a, um, keep a mark or something in, in Genesis, because we're going to come back there in just a moment. But just come with me to the New Testament and to the book of Romans. So in the, into the New Testament, and shortly after the, the, um, the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles, we have the letters. And Romans here is a letter from the Apostle Paul. And Romans chapter 5 gives us a, a synopsis uh, as to why we die. And so let's go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. So the book of Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. And there we read these words. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and sin is, um, uh, uh, sin is breaking the commandments of God, and so here we are talking about Adam and Eve breaking the commandments of God, as by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. That was a punishment. So the verse continues. And so death passed upon all men, for thus all have sinned. And so what the Apostle Paul is telling us is that since Adam and Eve, everyone has died because they have all broken the commandments of God. And unfortunately, it's a, it's a sad fact, isn't it, of our, our lives. That we all break the commandments of God. None of us are, are perfect in the sight of God. In some way or other, we all break his commandments. Probably fairly frequently, if, you, if you're anything like, um, like myself. But we all break God's commandments and therefore we all die. And so that's the principle. That we die because we all sin. Well, with that in mind, just come back to Genesis uh, and chapter 2. Because Genesis chapter 2 tells us that the process of, of, of life being formed, the formula for life, if we can call it that, and subsequently in chapter 3, the reversal of that. And so let's just go back to Genesis chapter 2 and to verse 7. 
Because there we read, didn't we, that God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils um, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so as I say, we have here the, the formula for life. We have that God took the dust of the ground and he breathed into it um, the breath of life. And as a result, it, man became a living being or uh, a living soul, as, uh, as we have in, in the authorised version. But man became living when God breathed the breath of life into um, this, this, this dust which he has formed um, man out of. And so this is a simple formula for life. When we see that God is in control of it, man uh, and the animals are, are therefore just dust uh, and, and the breath of life being brought together um, into a, a living being. And we've already briefly touched on it. But if we go over to chapter 3, we see that the punishment to Adam, that death, was a reversal of, of that process. And so chapter 19 read that they, Adam would return to the dust of the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And so Adam was, at that point, a, a living being. And God was going to take away the breath of life. Uh, and Adam uh, would turn um, back to dust. Uh, and so we have here a simple formula, um, if you like. But we see that God is in control of, of this process. That God is in control of, of giving and, uh, and taking away um, life. And the Bible is very clear for us that death is um, the reversal of, 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 of having life. And the Bible makes it very clear to us what the state of, of death is. Um, or sorry, the state in which we end up in once we do die. Uh, and unfortunately, it's, it's quite a bleak picture um, for the first um, few, few verses of it that we're going to go to. But the Bible makes it very clear what the situation of, of mankind is once they die. So we want to just have a look at um, four different passages um, just to emphasise um, this point. So first of all, let's go to Psalm 146. Sorry, let's go to Psalm, Psalm 146. So in the middle, middle of our Bibles, in the book of Psalms, 146 and verse 3. And here there, there, was, there was an exhortation, uh, some encouragement to um, the people, people of Israel as it was here. Verse 3, the psalmist says, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to the, his earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. And what the psalmist here is encouraging the people to, to trust in God rather than in, in mankind. And the reason, he says, in verse 3 and verse 4, is that mankind is unable to help. Mankind, at some point, his breath goes forth, the breath is taken away from him, and he returns to the earth. At some point man dies and so any help that he can give is limited. And so he says that he returns to the earth when God takes away um, his breath. And at the end of verse 4 he says in that very day his thoughts um, perish, perish. And that word thoughts means the idea of, of thinking but also the idea of purpose. Any plans which man has when they die, they all disappear, is what the Bible is saying. And so the Bible says that at some point we return to the earth when we die and our thoughts um, perish. Our intentions are, are no longer relevant. We can't do anything about them. Um, that essentially, that is it. Well, let's go forward then um, to Ecclesiastes for our, our next verse. The book of Ecclesiastes... Um, and we're going to start in, in chapter 3. So Ecclesiastes uh, and chapter 3. Uh, and so again, just following um, a few books further on from the book of Psalms. And we have here the words of 
um, or, or, of, um, or of the preacher, as, as he's entitled. Uh, and there's words contemplating the, the process of, of life and what can be achieved um, in, in life. Uh, and in Ecclesiastes in chapter 3 uh, and verse 19, we have this summary of what happens um, to mankind. And he says, verse 19 of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, For that which befall of the sons of men befall of beasts, even one thing befall of them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other, yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go unto one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. And so again, it's kind of a bleak picture, isn't it? Here we are told that ma mankind, men and women, are just like the animals are of the earth. There's no difference between us uh, and them when it comes to what happens uh, at death. He says they are all, verse 20, are of the dust. They've all been created um, by God. And he says, and all turn to dust again. So just as the animals that are around us die uh, and are buried, uh, and, and we know, don't we, that their, their bodies decompose uh, and they turn back to dust. So the same happens with, with us, with, with mankind. Here we are taught that there's no difference between the animals and mankind. Well, let's go for just a few chapters in, in Ecclesiastes to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Because again, here, the, the subject under consideration is around death and what happens um, at death. And Ecclesiastes chapter 9, we just want to pick out a few verses um, in, in this chapter. And, and so first of all, let's go to verse 5. So verse 5 of Ecclesiastes chapter 9. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. And so the first point here is that the living know that they shall die. And unfortunately, it's true, isn't it? We know that at some point, we are going to die. There's not a lot that we can do about it. We might be able to, to live our lives in a certain way, to try and extend our, our life. But we know at some point, we will die. But he then continues, But the dead, he says, know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward. The memory of them is forgotten. And so there's this idea that there's no reward, there's nothing that they, that once you die, there's nothing you can gain. You can't work for anything. There's no memory of, of them. And again, unfortunately, it's a sad, sad fact, isn't it? That those who, who die, there is, there is a memory of them for a period of time. But over the generations, that memory is lost, isn't it? It's forgotten. And if we were to try to think back to, to people who had died a hundred years ago, we would struggle, apart from those, those, we might be able to find some names that have been written down, but we would struggle to have any memory, any recollection of, of those individuals. Primarily because none of us were necessarily born at that point in time. But the memory of those who die slowly disappears and is forgotten. Well, let's come down to verse 10. What else are we told? Well, verse 10. Verse 10, we're told, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. And so we have, there's no work, there's no device, there's no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave. And so once we die, we are told that our, our, our mind has essentially ceased to work. There's no knowledge, there's no wisdom, there's no work or device. We can't physically do anything. And so there's nothing there, no activity, no thoughts, no actions, no events um, after death. As we say, it's a bit of a bleak picture at the moment, um, isn't it? Well, let's come down to verse 12. Verse 12. We read, For man also knoweth not his time. As the fishes that are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men, snared in an evil time, 
when it falleth suddenly uh, upon them. And so here we are told that no one knows when they will die. And again, that is true, isn't it? We said a few moments ago that there might be certain ways in which we can live our lives to try and extend our life. And that is true. But there can be many events that take place, can't there, where, which we aren't in control of. Where things happen. Whether it be um, coming into, uh, into an encounter with something that's, that, that unfortunately kills us. Or whether it be something health-wise, medical-wise. We don't know when we are going to die. And this verse 12 again describes mankind as very similar to the, the animals of the field, as fishes and as birds. That just as they don't know when they might get snared um, or, or caught uh, and die, so that we also don't know. Well, final passage to go through is back in Psalms and, and Psalm 49. So Psalm 49. Back to, back to the, the middle of our Bibles and Psalm 49. Uh, and again, we're going to pick out a couple of verses. And, and so first of all, verse 12. Verse 12, we read, Nevertheless, man, being in honour, abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. And so man can be in honour. He can be um, well respected and thought of in, in life. You can have a, have, a, have a great position in life. Things might be going well for you, but the psalmist says that he is like the beasts that perish. Just as the animals die around us, as we've seen already, so the same applies um, to us. And if we go down to verse 20, we see a very similar thing. Man that is in honour and understandeth not is like the beasts that perish. It's kind of emphasised for us, that mankind is just like the beasts and perishes in, in the same way. But just come back to verse 6. Because verse 6 also gives us some more detail about what happens at uh, death. And, and verse 6 says, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God um, a, a ransom for him. And if we come down to verse 16 and verse 17, just to continue those thoughts. Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. And so the psalmist is saying that regardless of how much wealth we might have, regardless of our position in society, there is nothing that we can do when death comes. There is nothing, verse 6 and 7, no one can pay or buy themselves out or, or, of dying. No one can negotiate with, with God um, when that point comes. But we all die regardless of, of the wealth or, or, or whatever it might be that we have um, in, in life. And so the psalmist here is continuing that theme. And so far it's quite a bleak picture, isn't it? That mankind is going to die just like the beasts. That there's nothing there existing for us after death. There's no thoughts. There's no actions. No work. No activity. The memory of us is forgotten uh, over time. We can't take anything with us when that time comes. And so it's quite a bleak um, picture. But yet the Bible gives us, does give us a hope. The Bible doesn't just portray this very bleak picture. There is a message of hope contained within it um, as well. Just come with me to the book of Romans again, and this time chapter 6. Because you see, there are a number of passages that, that we could go to, and we're going to go to a, a couple of them. But if we go to Romans chapter 6, we see this summarised um, for us. And we see that death does not have to be um, the end for us. And so Romans chapter 6, we're just going to pick out the one verse um, to start with. Uh, and that is in verse 23. And it's at the end of, of the chapter. So Romans chapter 6 uh, and verse 23. We read there, For the wages of sin is death. And that's largely what we've seen already, isn't it? That's what we saw in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. 
that because we sin, we therefore die. And so the wages is something that you earn, isn't it? If we go to work, we earn a wage and we are paid um, that wage. A wage is something that you earn. And so we see here in verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Because we sin, we die. But then continues, it continues in verse 23, but the gift of God is eternal life through, Christ, um, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so here, the Apostle Paul says that there is something else. There is, the wages of sin is death. We are going to die because we have sinned. But, he says, the gift of God is eternal life. So there is a gift from God, a possibility of eternal life. And he says it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Jesus, here we are told, has done something for us that means that we can have this hope of eternal life. But just know that it's a gift. It's not something that we can earn. It's something that God gives us. And so Jesus then has done something so that we can have this great hope of, of, of eternal life. And of course, eternal life means living forever, doesn't it? Which means no death at the end of it, because it does not end. And so there is this great hope then. But what is it? How is it that we can get access um, to this hope? How is it that we can have eternal life? <clears throat> well, just come back a couple of books in, in, our, in our Bibles to the, the Acts of the Apostles. So this is a time just after the Lord Jesus Christ has, has died and has been raised from the dead. And so we, early into in the New Testament... And Acts chapter 2, we have this speech of the Apostle Peter. Acts chapter 2, and we want to have a look at some verses from verse 22. So Acts chapter 2, verse 22, and this is the Apostle Peter speaking to um, the people of Israel, predominantly, um, who were gathered in Jerusalem for one of their feasts um, um, on the day of Pentecost. And verse 22 of Acts chapter 2, we read, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. And so the Apostle Peter is speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, that individual who is mentioned in Romans chapter 6. And he says, first of all, that he has been crucified and slain. He died. We are told that Jesus died. And he points the blame at the Jewish people for their actions and their part in his death in verse 23. But he says that Jesus has died. But then he continues in verse 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And then he quotes from verse 25 down to verse 28, a psalm of David, where David talks about someone not being left um, in the grave. And if we can recommence in, in verse 29, we read, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, so one of his descendants, he would raise up Christ to sit on, on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, and that's, that's the grave, Neither his flesh did see corruption. Therefore, verse 32, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all, sorry, we all are witnesses. And so the Apostle Peter expounds the psalm. And he says that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And just notice how many times the Apostle Peter says that. First of all, in verse 24, he says, whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death. So he says, first of all, that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Verse 31. David, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. 
that he did, was not left in the grave. Neither his flesh did see corruption. So again, emphasising that Jesus was raised from the dead and um, to back, back to life. Verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Three times the Apostle Peter is emphasising that Jesus was raised um, from the dead. But why was it that Jesus was raised from the dead? We have, throughout history, all of mankind has, has sinned against God and therefore has died, as we have seen already. Why was it then that Jesus was raised from the dead? Others hadn't been raised from the dead, so why was Jesus raised from the dead? Well, the reason was that Jesus did um, no sin. We are told on many occasions in the Bible that Jesus did not sin uh, against God. He was sinless. And so the principles which we've seen, that man dies because they have sinned, we see that those principles are, are there all the way through history, but yet Jesus did no sin. And so therefore... He was raised from the dead. He defeated sin in his life and God raised him from the dead once he had been killed by the Jewish rulers and the Roman soldiers. Jesus did not sin and therefore was raised from the dead. But it still, asks a, it still leaves a question, doesn't it? What about us? What does that mean for us? Romans chapter 6 says that we can have hope of eternal life through Jesus. But so far, we've only seen that Jesus got um, or was raised from the dead. Jesus was given that eternal life. But how does that um, affect us? Well, let's go now to the first book of Corinthians uh, and chapter 15. Because here the Apostle Paul is, is expounding to the early believers the importance of, of Jesus being raised from the dead. And he says that this is a critical um, belief for, for Christians, for anyone who wants to follow um, God um, and, and have a hope. It's critical that they believe that Jesus raised from the dead. And so let's just go in at verse 4. Um, or verse 3, I suppose, for, for context. The Apostle Paul says, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, uh, according to the scriptures. And so we've seen that already. He, was di he died, and he was raised. But then in verse 5, Then he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain till the present. But some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me. Also, And so the Apostle Paul here is, is telling the believers that it is indeed true that Jesus was raised from the dead. And he's setting before them the proof that Jesus was raised and that he was raised back to life. And he says from, verses, um, sorry, from verse 5 down to verse 8, he gives a list of those people who had seen Jesus after he had died and been raised from the dead. And he lists them. Uh, and we see that there's many, many people who saw Jesus after he had been raised. We have over 513 people who Jesus saw and, and, and communicated with after he, his death and his resurrection. And so the Apostle Paul is setting out that you can go and speak to these people. You, the, they witnessed. They saw Jesus. You can go and speak to them to check that these things are true. And so he emphasises that Jesus has been raised from the dead. But let's come now down to verse 20. And we can see the importance of that for us. So verse 20. But now is Christ raised from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And so we have this passage that's, that's there on the screen. 
and we've seen already that Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, and therefore they died. We've seen from Romans chapter 5 that we die because we sin. And so the same principles apply. We've seen that Christ did no sin. But yet he still died um, for us, we were told at the beginning of this chapter. And he was raised from the dead back to life. And then these verses tell us the great hope that that means for us. Because verse 21, um, since by man came death, and we've seen that, Adam Adam, um, Adam sinned and, and therefore death came. And, and since then, we've all sinned and therefore all died, or, or, or will die. Um, but he then says, verse 21, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. So Christ was the first one to be raised, just as Jesus was, the, uh, sorry, just as Adam was the first one to sin and to die. But then verse 22, as in Adam all die, and we've seen that, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And so we have sinned, and therefore we will die. But in, in Christ, we read in verse 22, shall all be made alive. There is the opportunity for everyone to be made alive, to be resurrected because of what Jesus ha has done. You see, Jesus died although he had done no sin. And therefore he has given us an amazing hope that just as he was raised from the dead, we also can be raised from the dead, have an opportunity to be resurrected and, and to have eternal life just as Jesus does. And so there's this amazing hope then through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible paints us this picture that's there is this bleak picture of death, that nothing happens after death. But there is a hope for those who follow um, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because verse 22 said that in Christ shall all be made alive. But then verse 23 continues. Every man in his own order. Christ the first fruit, so he was the first one to be raised. Afterwards, they that are Christ's at his coming. And so we have this pos possibility in verse 22 that everyone can be made uh, alive. Everyone can receive eternal life. And, but it's qualified in verse 23. That it's afterwards, they that are Christ's at his coming. So in order to receive that, that gift of eternal life, there is something we have to do. We have to be part of this group described as being Christ's in, in verse 23. We have to have done something to be, um, to be Christ's when he returns. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to, to be Christ's when, when he returns? What do we have to do to be Christ? Well, let's come back to the final passage, uh, to Romans uh, and chapter 6 once again. Because Romans chapter 6 details for us what it is that we have to do if we want to be a part of, of this amazing hope of, of resurrection and, and, and eternal life. And Romans chapter 6 is a passage which is, is about baptism and, and committing um, our lives to, um, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're just going to pick out a few verses. And so verse 3, first of all. Verse 3 says... Know ye not that so many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so here we, we see, sorry verse, five, sorry, verse 5 as well, for if we have become planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And so the Apostle Paul here is saying that those who are baptised, those who have committed their life to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, have in symbol died with the Lord Jesus Christ and been buried. Baptism is a symbol of, of, of death and of resurrection. And so we, if we go through baptism, then we are buried with Jesus. 
We are um, we we planted in the likeness of his death. That's what baptism is. It's a likeness of, of the death of, of of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we do that, if we commit our lives to him, and if we are baptized, then he says that like as Christ was raised from the dead, so we also shall walk in newness of life. And then at the end of verse five, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. That just as Jesus died, if we commit our lives to him and in symbol um, die and commit our, our, our lives to him, then we also, as he was raised and given life, we also have that opportunity as well. That we can be raised and given life. And this is emphasised throughout this chapter. Just go to verse 8 and verse 9. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. And so if we commit our lives to him. If we be dead with him, which is a, it's talk about a symbol of, of, of killing the, the ways of the sinful nature within us and committing our lives to him. If we do that, then we can live with him. And we've got highlighted there in purple. Now, this isn't a, this isn't a temporary um, state. We read that Jesus dies no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. This is an everlasting life. It is not being um, resurrected to, to live a life like we do now, but an everlasting life. And then finally, come back down to verse 23, which we saw um, or read um, a while ago. We saw that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus um, Christ our, our Lord. And so we have, the Bible sets before us, this amazing opportunity and amazing hope. That whilst the picture of death is very bleak, whilst the Bible tells us that after death there is nothing, there is no action, there's no thoughts, the memory is forgotten, we can't take anything with us. Whilst there is that picture, for those who believe in Jesus, for those who follow Jesus in their lives, those who commit their lives to him and are baptised and follow his commandments. There is this amazing hope of eternal life um, in, in God's kingdom. It's an amazing picture, um, isn't it? Uh, and so the Bible sets before us these two pictures. One a very bleak picture and one an amazing hope. A picture of everlasting life in, in God's kingdom with the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's two futures for us and we have to make the decision which one we want to be a part of. And if we want to have a part in an uh, opportunity to, to live forever with the Lord Jesus Christ, then we have to associate ourselves with him. We have to commit our lives to him, be baptised and to follow him, his commandments. Thank you.